The FDA is granting full approval to Pfizer's coronavirus vaccine. President Biden called it a key milestone in the fight against COVID-19. Officials are hoping this will jumpstart vaccinations, which have slowed in recent months. Hospitals across the South are struggling to handle a surge of mostly unvaccinated patients and new infections are rising among children. This afternoon, the president urged companies to follow his lead and make vaccines mandatory for employees. More companies, I should say, in the private sector to step up with vaccine requirements that will reach millions more people. If you're a business leader, a nonprofit leader, a state or local leader, who has been waiting for full FDA approval to require vaccinations, I call on you now to do that. Require it. Do what I did last month. Require your employees to get vaccinated or face strict requirements. The reason most people in America don't worry about polio, smallpox, measles, mumps, and rubella today is because of vaccines. It only makes sense to require a vaccine to stop the spread of COVID-19. Meanwhile, the pace of evacuations in Afghanistan sped up over the weekend. So far, the U.S. has removed more than 37,000 people from Kabul, half of them since Sunday. Pentagon officials say that includes several thousand Americans. Here's how Pentagon spokesman John Kirby characterized recent extraction missions when U.S. troops had to airlift Americans stranded outside the airport. On occasion, as needed, our commanders have... Uh, the authority that they need uh, to use their assets and their forces to help assist Americans who need to get to the airport get to the airport on a case-by-case case basis. It's not regular. Uh, I don't want to—I uh, don't want to leave you with the idea that we're somehow patrolling the streets of Kabul. But on occasion, where there's a need and there's a capability to meet that need, our commanders on the ground are doing what they feel they need to do to help Americans reach the airport. Plus, there is a standoff between Democrats on Capitol Hill. A group of nine House moderates are threatening to derail President Biden's agenda. They say they won't vote to advance Democrats' budget plan unless there's a vote on the bipartisan infrastructure bill first. For more, let's bring in Nicole Killian, Liz Goodwin, and Sarah Muha. Nicole is a CBS News congressional correspondent. Liz is the Boston Globe's Washington bureau chief. And Sarah is a political reporter for Axios. Welcome to you all. A busy news day. Liz, let me start with you. What are some of the policy changes we might see now that Pfizer's coronavirus vaccine has full FDA authorization? Well, as President Biden mentioned, he's really hoping that the private sector will step up and mandate vaccines, but also the public sector. I mean, you had the Pentagon. They foreshadowed they would be requiring the vaccine once it was fully approved, and, and now they've gone ahead and announced that. There isn't a timeline yet, but uh, the 1.3 million active duty service members will all have to be vaccinated, and there was about a third of them who hadn't as of last month. Um, so there was some hesitancy among the troops to get the vaccine, which now will no longer be an option unless you have a medical or a religious exemption. And then I think Biden is really hoping that private sector companies will now require the vaccine, given that it's fully approved. There's some potential legal issues requiring a vaccine that isn't, and now those are gone. So there's a lot less uh, barriers for companies who want to make sure their employees are all vaccinated, want to mandate them to be back in the office to do so. To do so. And some have already, um, you know, Chevron announced, I think, yesterday that they would be requiring thousands of their employees to get vaccinated. So it feels like we're at a tipping point moment for that. Yeah, we'll continue to see what happens as a result. On Afghanistan, Sarah, there is a big difference in the way Afghanistan is being covered on national TV and what is making headlines in local newspapers where the pandemic is largely the front page story. That being said, CBS News polling shows only 47 percent of Americans approve of Joe Biden's handling of the withdrawal, a 13 point drop from a month ago. Now, I know you've been speaking with voters. Did you get a sense of how big an issue this might be in the midterm elections? 
<laughs> yeah, that's right. I traveled to Virginia's 7th district last week where I spoke to voters in uh, Virginia in, in a district that's considered a bellwether district. So uh, basically that means that it historically has fallen along the lines of where the country stands politically. And I learned, you know, from this one piece of evidence, at least anecdotally, that Republican efforts to make this a political issue could fall flat. Uh, Afghanistan did not come up between uh, Rep Representative Abigail Spanberger and her constituents. Instead, voters asked her about COVID, about uh, infrastructure. They asked her about legalizing marijuana. Then when I spoke to the voters one-on-one -on -one and I specifically asked them about Afghanistan, they had been following the news. They were horrified, those harrowing images coming out of the country. But ultimately, they said this was not an issue they intended to vote on in the midterms or in the presidential election. And I think this one quote from a restaurant owner really stuck out to me. She said, we might not have a Taliban, but with the capital insurrection and the partisanship, we don't have a government that functions. We need to focus on home. So clearly voters' minds, mm. at least in this district, are very much focused on domestic issues for the time being. Yep. It's really interesting to hear that perspective because, you know, Democrats are very much focused on Afghanistan. Nicole, what can you tell us about the congressional hearings that Democrats say they want to hold on Afghanistan and any plans that Republicans may have going forward on this? Well, we're still waiting for details on uh, these hearings and when exactly they may occur. What we do know is that there are a number of briefings scheduled, actually one happening this evening, as well as another classified briefing uh, that will be held tomorrow. And so, uh, you know, lawmakers uh, really want to get as many answers as possible from this administration. You know, Democrats are trying to give the Biden administration uh, the benefit of the doubt that they're doing the best job they can under the circumstances and that at this point it's just about getting the mission complete. Uh, Republicans, on the other hand, have been extremely critical of the Biden administration for mishandling this. Uh, they also feel in some of these briefings that they've already had to date that they haven't necessarily gotten all of their concerns uh, addressed, uh, but they really are trying to hammer uh, the administration over this uh, using as many opportunities opportunities they can uh, to try to drive that point home, uh, thinking that it could potentially also be an issue for the upcoming midterms. Uh, but again, uh, we do expect at some point here on the Hill, uh, you know, hearings to be held with high-level administration officials, whether that ultimately is the Secretary of Defense, the Secretary of State. Those are the types of officials who have been briefing lawmakers uh, and will be briefing lawmakers once again tomorrow. All right, Nicole Killian, I know you have to run. Thank you so much, Nicole. Sarah, let me turn to you. The White House has just eight days left to evacuate potentially tens of thousands of people from Afghanistan by the August 31st deadline. Are they confident they can pull that off? Well, at least publicly, they're optimistic that they can meet that August 31st deadline. They're saying that any American that wants to get out of Afghanistan by then will be able to. But this statement publicly is made complicated by the fact that the administration has said that they don't actually know how many Americans are left in the country. Uh, President Biden last night said that he hopes that he can uh, meet that August 31st deadline, but there was possibility of discussions gone going during the week. And then National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan said today that the president is taking it on a day-by-day -day basis. So every day he's being briefed constantly and he's going to make the judgment uh, at any point uh, beyond or be before that August 31st deadline. Now, this is an important deadline, of course, because the Taliban reiterated last night. They said that the August 31st deadline is a red line for them, that there will be repercussions if the United States doesn't pull out its military. But Biden is also being pressured by our foreign allies, specifically Britain and France, have said that they want the president to push back that August 31st deadline. Uh, their own ongoing rescue operations are reliant on the United States military presence. There obviously we have a much greater military presence in Afghanistan than either of those countries. And 
Prime Minister Boris Johnson, the UK Prime Minister, said that this is something that he's going to bring up in uh, the G7 meeting tomorrow with the president. So that's definitely something to look out for to see if that public campaign pressure is enough for the president to uh, extend that deadline. Yeah, it is um, a really tenuous kind of position here. Eight days certainly doesn't seem like that long at all. Um, on the domestic front, Liz, uh, as we mentioned, moderate Democrats are threatening to vote against a key part of President Biden's domestic agenda. The budget plan contains sweeping proposals for climate change, Medicare and immigration. Can House Speaker Nancy Pelosi move this legislation forward without their support? And is she in a position to give them what they're asking for? Well, as people who've watched The Hill for a long time would say, you know, don't bet against Nancy Pelosi. She's gotten herself out of mm -hmm. stickier jams than this one. But the, the short answer is no, she, she can't move this without these nine moderates. So they do, they do need to come to a deal. Um, and today has been a lot of back and forth negotiation on The Hill. Uh, with some progress being made reportedly on finding a way to get those moderates on board with uh, letting the, the second infrastructure package go forward that has all of these Democratic priorities that Pelosi really needs to keep the left part of her flank together. It's, it's been a tightrope kind of walk this whole time with the bipartisan bill and then the more liberal, bigger bill that she hopes to at least get the the first few votes over with this week. Um, and so it seems like the group of moderates who have been trying to push for the bipartisan bill to get a vote first are a little bit more open to negotiation on that demand than it maybe seemed from their, from their initial statements. So it appears that they might be able to get a deal this week and the White House is trying to help out by signaling that they're behind Pelosi a hundred percent. Biden's been reaching out to some of the moderates. So a lot is going on behind the scenes today to try to get that deal together. That was going to be my question is to what extent is the president himself involved? He's making calls, it sounds like, Liz. Yes, Biden's making calls. I mean, as you mentioned, there's a lot going on with Afghanistan, but this is so central to his entire domestic agenda, the getting infrastructure done. Um, so this is really a make or break moment for the White House and they know it and they're um, they're working on this as well. Particularly busy and challenging time. Liz Goodwin and Sarah Muha, great to have you both. Thank you.